Ella. Juliet. In the dead of night, I hear birds. I hear them, I see them, I close my eyes and feel them, feathers shuddering in the air, bending the wind, wings grazing my shoulders when they ascend, when they alight. Discordant shrieks ring and echo, ring and echo. How many? Hundreds. White birds, white with streaks of gold like crowns atop their heads. They fly, they soar through the sky with strong, steady wings, masters of their destinies. They used to make me hope. Never again. I turn my face into the pillow, digging fingers into cotton flesh as the memories crash into me. Do you like them? She says. We're in a big, wide room that smells like dirt. There are trees everywhere, so tall they nearly touch the pipes and beams of the open ceiling. Birds, dozens of them, screech as they stretch their wings. Their calls are loud, a little scary. I try not to flinch as one of the large white birds swoops past me. It wears a bright neon green bracelet around one leg. They all do. This doesn't make sense. I remind myself that we're indoors, the white walls, the concrete floor under my feet, and I look up at my mother, confused. I've never seen mom smile so much. Mostly she smiles when dad is around or when she and dad are off in the corner, whispering together. But right now it's just me and mom and a bunch of birds, and she's so happy. I decide to ignore the funny feeling in my stomach. Things are better when mom is in a good mood. Yes, I lie. I like them a lot. Her eyes brighten. I knew you would. Emmeline didn't care for them, but you? You've always been a bit too fond of things, haven't you, darling? Not at all like your sister. Somehow her words come out mean. They don't seem mean, but they sound mean. I frown. I'm still trying to figure out what's happening when she says, I had one as a pet when I was about your age. Back then, they were so common we could never be rid of them. She laughs, and I watch her as she watches a bird mid-flight. One of them lived in a tree near my house, and it called my name whenever I walked past. Can you imagine? Her smile fades as she asks the question. Finally, she turns to look at me. They're very nearly extinct now. You understand why I couldn't let that happen. Of course, I say, but I'm lying again. There is little I understand about mom. She nods. These are a special sort of creature, intelligent. They can speak, dance, and each of them wears a crown. She turns away again, staring at the birds the way she stares at all the things she makes for work, with joy. The sulfur-crested cockatoo mates for life, she says, just like me and your father. The sulfur-crested cockatoo. I shiver, suddenly, at the unexpected sensation of a warm hand on my back, fingers trailing lightly along my spine. Love, he says. Are you all right? When I say nothing, he shifts, the sheets rustling, and he tucks me into his hollows, his body curving around mine. He's warm and strong, and as his hand slides down my torso, I cant my head toward him, finding peace in his presence, in the safety of his arms. His lips touch my skin, a graze against my neck so subtle it sparks, hot and cold, right down to my toes. Is it happening again? he whispers. My mother was born in Australia. I know this because she once told me so, and because now, despite my desperation to resist many of the memories now returned to me, I can't forget. She once told me that the sulfur-crested cockatoo was native to Australia. It was introduced to New Zealand in the 19th century, but Evie, my mother, didn't discover them there. She fell in love with the birds back home as a child, when one of them, she claims, saved her life. These were the birds that once haunted my dreams. These birds kept and bred by a crazy woman. I feel embarrassed to realize I'd held fast to nonsense, to the faded, disfigured impressions of old memories poorly discarded. I'd hoped for more, dreamed of more. Disappointment lodges in my throat, a cold stone I'm unable to swallow. And then, again, I feel it. I stiffen against the nausea that precedes a vision, the sudden punch to the gut that means there's more, there's more, there's always more. Aaron pulls me closer, holds me tighter against his chest. Breathe, he whispers. I'm right here, love. I'll be right here. 
I cling to him, squeezing my eyes shut as my head swims. These memories were a gift from my sister Emmeline, the sister I only just discovered, only just recovered, and only because she fought to find me. Despite my parents' relentless efforts to rid our minds of the lingering proof of their atrocities, Emmeline prevailed. She used her psychokinetic powers to return to me what was stolen from my memories. She gave me this gift, this gift of remembering, to help me save myself, to save her, to stop our parents, to fix the world. But now, in the wake of a narrow escape, this gift has become a curse. Every hour my mind is reborn, altered. The memories keep coming, and my dead mother refuses to be silenced. Little bird, she whispers, tucking a stray hair behind my ear. It's time for you to fly away now. But I don't want to go, I say, fear making my voice shake. I want to stay here with you and Dad and Emmeline. I still don't understand why I have to leave. You don't have to understand, she says gently. I go uncomfortably still. Mom doesn't yell. She's never yelled. My whole life, she's never raised a hand to me, never shouted or called me names. Not like Aaron's dad. But mom doesn't need to yell. Sometimes she just says things. Things like, you don't have to understand. And there's a warning there. A finality in her words that's always scared me. I feel tears forming, burning the whites of my eyes and no crying. She says, you're far too old for that now. I sniff. Hard, fighting back the tears, but my hands won't stop shaking. Mum looks up, nods at someone behind me. I turn around just in time to spot Paris, Mr. Anderson, waiting with my suitcase. There's no kindness in his eyes, no warmth at all. He turns away from me, looks at Mum. He doesn't say hello. He says, has Max settled in yet? Oh, he's been ready for days. Mum glances at her watch, distracted. You know Max, she says, smiling faintly. Always a perfectionist. Only when it comes to your wishes, says Mr. Anderson. I've never seen a grown man so besotted with his wife. Mum smiles wider. She seems about to say something, but I cut her off. Are you talking about Dad? I ask, my heart racing. Will Dad be there? My mother turns to me, surprised, like she'd forgotten I was there. She turns back to Mr. Anderson. How's Lila doing, by the way? Fine, he says, but he sounds irritated. Mom? Tears threaten again. Am I going to stay with Dad? But Mom doesn't seem to hear me. She's talking to Mr. Anderson when she says, Max will walk you through everything when you arrive, and he'll be able to answer most of your questions. If there's something he can't answer, it's likely beyond your clearance. Mr. Anderson looks suddenly annoyed. But he says nothing. Mum says nothing. I can't stand it. Tears are spilling down my face now. My body shaking so hard it makes my breaths rattle. Mum, I whisper. Mum, please answer me. Mum clamps a cold, hard hand around my shoulder and I go instantly still. Quiet. She's not looking at me. She won't look at me. You'll handle this too, she says. Won't you, Paris? Mr. Anderson meets my eyes then, so blue, so cold. Of course. A flash of heat courses through me, a rage so sudden it briefly replaces my terror. I hate him. I hate him so much that it does something to me when I look at him, and the abrupt surge of emotion makes me feel brave. I turn back to Mum. try again. Why does Emmeline get to stay? I ask, wiping angrily at my wet cheeks. If I have to go, can't we at least go to get... I cut myself off when I spot her. My sister, Emmeline, is peeking out at me from behind the mostly closed door. She's not supposed to be here. Mum said so. Emmeline is supposed to be doing her swimming lessons. But she's here, her wet hair dripping on the floor, and she's staring at me, eyes wide as plates. She's trying to say something, but her lips move too fast for me to follow. And then out of nowhere, a bolt of electricity runs up my spine and I hear her voice, sharp and strange. Liars, liars, kill them all. My 
My eyes fly open and I can't catch my breath, my chest heaving, heart pounding. Warner holds me, making soothing sounds as he runs a reassuring hand up and down my arm. Tears spill down my face and I swipe at them, hands shaking. I hate this, I whisper, horrified at the tremble in my voice. I hate this so much. I hate that it keeps happening. I hate what it does to me, I say. I hate it. Warner. Aaron presses his cheek against my shoulder with a sigh, his breath teasing my skin. I hate it too, he says softly. I turn carefully in the cradle of his arms and press my forehead to his bare chest. It's been less than two days since we escaped Oceania. Two days since I killed my own mother. Two days since I met the residue of my sister, Emmeline. Only two days since my entire life was upended yet again, which feels impossible. Two days and already things are on fire around us. This is our second night here at the sanctuary, the locus of the rebel group run by Noria, Castle's daughter, and her wife, Sam. We're supposed to be safe here. We're supposed to be able to breathe and regroup after the hell of the last few weeks, but my body refuses to settle. My mind is overrun, under attack. I thought the rush of new memories would eventually gut her out, but these last 24 hours have been an unusually brutal assault, and I seem to be the only one struggling. Emmeline gifted all of us, all the children of the Supreme Commanders, with memories stolen by our parents. One by one, we were awoken to the truths our parents had buried, and one by one, we were returned to normal lives. All but me. The others have since moved on, reconciled their timelines, made sense of the betrayal. My mind, on the other hand, continues to falter, spin. But then none of the others lost as much as I did. They don't have as much to remember. Even Warner, Aaron, isn't experiencing so thorough a reimagining of his life. It's beginning to scare me. I feel as though my history is being rewritten, infinite paragraphs scratched out and hastily revised, old and new images, memories, layer atop each other until the ink runs, rupturing the scenes into something new, something incomprehensible. Occasionally my thoughts feel like disturbing hallucinations, and the onslaught is so invasive I fear it's doing irreparable damage. Because something is changing. Every new memory is delivered with an emotional violence that drives into me, reorders my mind. I'd been feeling this pain in flickers, the sickness, the nausea, the disorientation, but I haven't wanted to question it too deeply. I haven't wanted to look too closely. The truth is, I didn't want to believe my own fears. But the truth is, I am a punctured tire. Every injection of air leaves me both fuller and flatter. I am forgetting. Ella? Terror bubbles up inside of me, bleeds through my open eyes. It takes me a moment to remember that I am Juliet. <laughs> Ella. Each time, it takes me a moment longer. Hysteria threatens. I force it down. Yes, I say, forcing air into my lungs. Yes. Warner. <laughs> Aaron. Stiffens. Love, what's wrong? Nothing. I lie. My heart is pounding fast, too fast. I don't know why I'm lying. It's a fruitless effort. He can sense everything I'm feeling. I should just tell him. I don't know why I'm not telling him. I know why I'm not telling him. I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see if this will pass, if the lapses in my memory are only glitches waiting to be repaired. Saying it out loud makes it too real. And it's too soon to say these thoughts aloud, to give in to the fear. After all, it's only been a day since it started. It only occurred to me yesterday that something was truly wrong. It occurred to me because I made a mistake. Mistakes. We were sitting outside, staring at the stars. I couldn't remember ever seeing the stars like that, sharp, clear. It was late, so late it wasn't night but infant morning and the view was dizzying. I was freezing. A brave wind stole through a copse nearby, filling the air with steady sound. I was full of cake. Warner smelled like sugar, like decadence. I felt drunk on joy. I don't want to wait, he said, taking my hand. 
squeezing it. Let's not wait. I blinked up at him. For what? For what? For what? How did I forget what had happened just hours earlier? How did I forget the moment he asked me to marry him? It was a glitch. It felt like a glitch, where there was once a memory was suddenly a vacancy, a cavity held empty only until nudged into realignment. I recovered, remembered. Warner laughed. I did not. I forgot the name of Castle's daughter. I forgot how we landed at the sanctuary. I forgot for a full two minutes how I ever escaped Oceania. But my errors were temporary. They seemed like natural delays. I experienced only confusion as my mind buffered, hesitation as the memories resurfaced, waterlogged and vague. I thought maybe I was tired, overwhelmed. I took none of it seriously, not until I was sitting under the stars and couldn't remember promising to spend the rest of my life with someone. Mortification. Mortification so acute I thought I'd expire from the full force of it. Even now, fresh heat floods my face and I find I'm relieved Warner can't see in the dark. Aaron, not Warner, Aaron. I can't tell just now whether you're afraid or embarrassed, he says and exhales softly. It sounds almost like a laugh. Are you worried about Kenji, about the others? I grab onto this half-truth with my whole heart. Yes, I say. Kenji, James, Adam. Kenji has been sick in bed since very early this morning. I squint at the slant of moon through our window and remember that it's long past midnight, which would mean that technically Kenji got sick yesterday morning. Regardless, it was terrifying for all of us. The drugs Nazira forced into Kenji on their international flight from Sector 45 to Oceania were a dose too strong, and he's been reeling ever since. He finally collapsed. The twins, Sonia and Sarah, have checked in on him and say he's going to be just fine, but not before we learned that Anderson has been rounding up the children of the Supreme Commanders. Adam and James and Lena and Valentina and Nicholas are all in Anderson's custody. James is in his custody. It's been a devastating, awful couple of days. It's been a devastating, awful couple of weeks. Months, really. Years. Some days, no matter how far back I go, I can't seem to find the good times. Some days, the occasional happiness I've known feels like a bizarre dream, an error, hyper-real and unfocused, the colors too bright and the sounds too strong, figments of my imagination. It was just days ago that clarity came to me, bearing gifts. Just days ago that the worst seemed behind me, that the world seemed full of potential, that my body was stronger than ever, my mind fuller, sharper, more capable than I'd ever known it. But now, but now, but now, I feel like I'm clinging to the blurring edges of sanity, that elusive fair-weather friend always breaking my heart. Aaron pulls me close and I melt into him, grateful for his warmth for the steadiness of his arms around me. I take a deep, shuddering breath and let it all go, exhaling against him. I inhale the rich, heady scent of his skin, the faint aroma of gardenias he somehow carries with him always. Seconds pass in perfect silence, and we listen to each other breathe. Slowly, my heart rate steadies. The tears dry up. The fears take five. Terror is distracted by a passing butterfly and sadness takes a nap. For a little while, it's just me and him and us and everything is untarnished, untouched by darkness. I knew I loved Warner, Aaron, before all this. Before we were captured by the reestablishment, before we were ripped apart, before we learned of our shared history. But that love was new, green, its depths uncharted, untested. In that brief, glimmering window during which the gaping holes in my memory felt fully accounted for, things between us changed. Everything between us changed. Even now, even with the noise in my head, I feel it. Here, this. My bones against his bones. This is my home. I feel him suddenly stiffen and I pull back, concerned. I can't see much of him in this perfect darkness. 
but I feel the delicate rise of goosebumps along his arms when he says, What are you thinking about? My eyes widen, comprehension dethroning concern. I was thinking about you. Me? I close the gap between us again, nod against his chest. He says nothing, but I can hear his heart racing in the quiet, and eventually I hear him exhale. It's a heavy, uneven sound, like he might have been holding his breath for too long. I wish I could see his face. No matter how much time we spend together, I still forget how much he can feel my emotions, especially at times like this, when our bodies are pressed together. Gently, I run my hand down his back. I was thinking about how much I love you, I say. He goes uncommonly still, but only for a moment. And then he touches my hair, his fingers slowly combing the strands. Did you feel it, I ask? When he doesn't answer, I pull back again. I blink against the black until I'm able to make out the glint of his eyes, the shadow of his mouth. Aaron? Yes, he says, but he sounds a little breathless. Yes, you felt it? Yes, he says again. What does it feel like? He sighs, rolls onto his back. He's quiet for so long that for a while, I'm not sure he's going to answer. And softly, he says. It's hard to describe. It's a pleasure so close to pain I sometimes can't tell the two apart. That sounds awful. No, he says. It's exquisite. I love you. A sharp intake of breath. Even in this darkness, I see the strain in his jaw, the tension there, as he stares at the ceiling. I sit straight up, surprised. Aaron's reaction is so unstudied, I don't know how I never noticed it before. But then, maybe this is new. Maybe something really has changed between us. Maybe I never loved him this much before. That would make sense, I suppose. Because when I think about it, when I really think about how much I love him now, after everything we've, another sudden sharp breath. And then he laughs, nervously. Wow, I say. He claps a hand over his eyes. This is vaguely mortifying. I'm smiling now, very nearly laughing. Hey, it's... My body seizes. A violent shudder rushes up my skin and my spine goes rigid. My bones held in place by invisible pins my mouth frozen open and trying to draw breath. Heat fills my vision. I hear nothing but static, grand rapids, white water, ferocious wind, feel nothing, think nothing, am nothing. I am, for the most infinitesimal moment, free. My eyelids flutter open, closed, open, closed, open, closed. I am a wing, two wings, a swinging door, five birds, Fire climbs inside of me, explodes. Ella? The voice appears in my mind with swift strength, sharp like darts to the brain. Dully, I realize that I'm in pain. My jaw aches, my body still suspended in an unnatural position, but I ignore it. The voice tries again. Juliet? Realization strikes, a knife to the knees. Images of my sister fill my mind, bones and melted skin, webbed fingers, sodden mouth, no eyes. Her body suspended underwater, long brown hair like a swarm of eels. Her strange disembodied voice pierces through me, and so I say without speaking, Emmeline? Emotion drives into me, fingers digging in my flesh, sensation scraping across my skin. Her relief is tangible. I can taste it. She's relieved, relieved I recognized her, relieved she found me, relieved, relieved, relieved. What happened, I ask. A deluge of images floods my brain until it sinks, I sink. Her memories drown my senses, clog lungs. I choke as the feelings crash into me. I see Max, my father, inconsolable in the wake of his wife's murder. I see Supreme Commander Ibrahim, frantic and furious, demanding Anderson gather the other children before it's too late. I see Emmeline, briefly abandoned, seizing an opportunity. I gasp. Evie made it so that 
only she or Max could control Emmeline's powers, and with Evie dead, the fail-safes implemented were suddenly weakened. Emmeline realized that in the wake of our mother's death, there would be a brief window of opportunity, a brief window during which she might be able to wrest back control of her own mind before Max remade the algorithms. But Evie's work was too good, and Max's reaction too prompt. Emmeline was only partly successful. Dying, she says to me. Dying. Every flash of her emotion is accompanied by torturous assault. My flesh feels bruised. My spine seems liquid. My eyes blind, searing. I feel Emmeline. Her voice, her feelings, her visions, more strongly than before, because she's stronger than before. That she managed to regain enough power to find me is proof alone that she is at least partly untethered, unrestrained. Max and Evie had been experimenting on Emmeline to a reckless degree in the last several months, trying to make her stronger even as her body withered. This, this, is the consequence. Being this close to her is nothing short of excruciating. I think I've screamed. Have I screamed? Everything about Emmeline is heightened to a fever pitch. Her presence is wild, breathtaking, and it shudders to life inside my nerves. Sound and sensation streak across my vision, barrel through me violently. I hear a spider scuttle across the wooden floor. Tired moths drag their wings along the wall. A mouse startles, settles in its sleep. Dust motes fracture against a window, shrapnel skidding across the glass. My eyes skitter, unhinged in my skull. I feel the oppressive weight of my hair, my limbs, my flesh wrapped around me like cellophane, a leather casket. My tongue, my tongue is a dead lizard perched in my mouth, rough and heavy. The fine hairs on my arms stand and sway, stand and sway. My fists are so tightly clenched, my fingernails pierce the soft flesh of my palms. I feel a hand on me. Where am I? Lonely, she says. She shows me. A vision of us back in the laboratory where I first saw her, where I killed our mother. I see myself from Emmeline's point of view, and it's startling. She can't see much more than a blur, but she can feel my presence, can make out the shape of my form, the heat emanating from my body, and then my words, my own words, hurled back into my brain. There has to be another way. You don't have to die. We can get through this together, please. I want my sister back. I want you to live, Emmeline. I won't let you die here. Emmeline? Emmeline, we can get through this together. We can get through this together. We can get through this together. A cold, metallic sensation begins to bloom in my chest. It moves through me, up my arms, down my throat, pushes into my gut. My teeth throb. Emmeline's pain claws and slithers, clings with a ferocity I can't bear. Her tenderness, too, is desperate, terrifying in its sincerity. She's overcome by emotion, hot and cold, fueled by rage and devastation. She's been looking for me all this time. In these last couple of days, Emmeline has been searching the conscious world for my mind, trying to find safe harbor, a place to rest, a place to die. Emmeline, I say, please, sister. Something tightens in my mind, squeezes. Fear propels through me, punctures organs. I'm wheezing. I smell earth and damp, decomposing leaves, and I feel the stars staring at my skin, wind pushing through darkness like an anxious parent. My mouth is open, catching moths. I am on the ground. Where? No longer in my bed, I realize. No longer in my tent, I realize. No longer protected. But when did I walk? Who moved my feet? Who pushed my body? How far? I try to look around, but I'm blind. My head trapped in a vice. My neck reduced to fraying sinew. My breaths fill my ears, harsh and loud. Harsh and loud. Rough, rough gasping efforts my head. Swings. My fists unclench, 
nails scraping as my fingers uncurl, palms flattening. I smell heat, taste wind, hear dirt. Dirt under my hands, in my mouth, under my fingernails. I'm screaming, I realize. Someone is touching me and I'm screaming. Stop, I scream. Please, Emmeline, please don't do this. Lonely, she says. Lonely. And with a sudden, ferocious agony, I am displaced. Kenji. It feels weird to call it luck. It feels weird, but in some perverse, twisted way, this is luck. Luck that I'm standing in the middle of damp, freezing woodlands before the sun's bothered to lift its head. Luck that my bare upper body is half numb from cold. Luck that Nazira is with me. We pulled on our invisibility almost instantly, so she and I are at least temporarily safe here in the half-mile stretch of untouched wilderness between regulated and unregulated territories. The sanctuary was built on a couple of acres of unregulated land not far from where I'm standing, and it's masterfully hidden in plain sight only because of Nuria's unnatural talent for bending and manipulating light. Within Nuria's jurisdiction, the climate is somehow more temperate, the weather more predictable. But out here in the wild, the winds are relentless and combative. The temperatures are dangerous. Still, we're lucky to be here at all. Nazira and I had been out of bed for a while, racing through the dark in an attempt at murdering one another. In the end, it all turned out to be a complicated misunderstanding, but it was also a kind of kismet. If Nazira hadn't snuck into my room at three o'clock in the morning and nearly killed me, I wouldn't have chased her through the forest, beyond the sight and soundproof protections of the sanctuary. If we hadn't been so far from the sanctuary, we never would have heard the distant, echoing screams of citizens crying out in terror. If we hadn't heard those cries, we never would have rushed toward the source. And if we hadn't done any of that, I never would have seen my best friend screaming her way into dawn. I would have missed this. This. Jay on her knees in the cold dirt. Warner crouched down beside her, both of them looking like death while the clouds literally melt out of the sky above them. The two of them are parked right outside the entrance to the sanctuary, straddling the untouched stretch of forest that serves as a buffer between our camp and the heart of the nearest sector, number 241. Why? I froze when I saw them there. Two broken figures entwined, limbs planted in the ground. I was paralyzed by confusion, then fear, then disbelief. All while the trees bent sideways and the wind snapped at my body, cruelly reminding me that I'd never had a chance to put on a shirt. If my night had gone differently, I might have had that chance. If my night had gone differently, I might have enjoyed, for the first time in my life, a romantic sunrise and an overdue reconciliation with a beautiful girl. Nazira and I would have laughed about how she'd kicked me in the back and almost killed me, and how afterward I almost shot her for it. After that, I would have taken a long shower, slept until noon, and eaten my weight in breakfast foods. I had a plan for today. Take it easy. I wanted a little more time to heal after my most recent near-death experience, and I didn't think I was asking for much. I thought that, maybe, after everything I'd been through, the world might finally cut me some slack. Let me breathe between tragedies. Nah. Instead, I'm here, dying of frostbite and horror, watching the world fall to pieces around me. The sky, swinging wildly between horizontal and vertical horizons. The air, puncturing at random. Trees, sinking into the ground. Leaves, tap dancing around me. I'm seeing it. I'm actively witnessing it. And still I can't believe it. But I'm choosing to call it luck. Luck that I'm seeing this. Luck that I feel like I might throw up. Luck that I ran all this way in my still ill, injured body just in time to score a front row seat to the end of the world. Luck, fate, coincidence, serendipity. I'll call this sick, sinking feeling in my gut a fucking magic trick if it'll help me keep my eyes open long enough to bear witness. To figure out how to help because no one else is here. No one but me and Nazira, 
which seems crazy to an improbable degree. The sanctuary is supposed to have security on patrol at all times, but I see no sentries and no sign of incoming aid. No soldiers from the nearby sector either. Not even curious, hysterical civilians. Nothing. It's like we're standing in a vacuum on an invisible plane of existence. I don't know how Jay and Warner made it this far without being spotted. The two of them look like they were literally dragged through the dirt. I have no idea how they escaped notice, and though it's possible Jay only just started screaming, I still have a thousand unanswered questions. They'll have to wait. I glance at Nazira out of habit, forgetting for a moment that she and I are invisible. But then I feel her step closer, and I breathe a sigh of relief as her hand slips into mine. She squeezes my fingers. I return the pressure. Lucky, I remind myself. It's lucky that we're here right now, because if I'd been in bed where I should have been, I wouldn't have even known Jay was in trouble. I would have missed the tremble in my friend's voice as she cried out, begging for mercy. I would have missed the shattering colors of a twisted sunrise, a peacock in the middle of hell. I would have missed the way Jay clamped her head between her hands and sobbed. I would have missed the sharp scents of pine and sulfur in the wind, would have missed the dry ache in my throat, the tremor moving through my body. I would have missed the moment Jay mentioned her sister by name. I wouldn't have heard Jay specifically ask her sister not to do something. Yeah, this is definitely luck. Because if I hadn't heard any of that, I wouldn't have known who to blame. Emmeline. Ella. Juliet. I have eyes, too. Feel them rolling back and forth, around and around in my skull. I have lips, too. Feel them wet and heavy, pry them open, have teeth, many. Tongue, one, and fingers, ten. Count them. One, two, three, four, five. Again on the other side, strange, strange to have a tongue. Strange, it's a strange sort of thing. A strange sort of thing. Loneliness. It creeps up on you, quiet and still. Sits by your side in the dark. Strokes your hair as you sleep, wraps itself around your bones, squeezing so tight you almost can't breathe, almost can't hear the pulse racing in your blood as it rush, rushes up your skin, touches its lips to the soft hairs at the back of your neck. Loneliness is a strange sort of thing, a strange sort of thing, an old friend standing beside you in the mirror, screaming, you're not enough, never enough, never, ever enough. Sometimes it just won't let go. Kenji. I sidestep an eruption in the ground and duck just in time to avoid a cluster of vines growing in midair. A distant rock balloons to an astronomical size, and the moment it starts barreling in our direction, I tighten my hold on Nazira's hand and dive for cover. The sky is ripping apart. The ground is fracturing beneath my feet. The sun flickers, strobing darkness, strobing light, everything stilted. And the clouds. There's something newly wrong with the clouds. They're disintegrating. Trees can't decide whether to stand up or lie down. Gusts of wind shoot up from the ground with terrifying power, and suddenly the sky is full of birds. Full of fucking birds! Emmeline is out of control. We knew that her telekinetic and psychokinetic powers were godlike, beyond anything we've ever known, and we knew that the reestablishment built Emmeline to control our experience of the world. But that was all. And that was just talk. Theory. We'd never seen her like this. Wild. She's clearly doing something to Jay right now, ravaging her mind while lashing out at the world around us, because the acid trip I'm staring at is only getting worse. Go back, I cry out over the din, 
Get help. Bring the girls. A single shout of agreement, and Nazira's hand slips free from mine, her heavy boots on the ground my only indication that she's bolting toward the sanctuary. But even now, especially now, her swift, certain actions fill me with no small measure of relief. It feels good to have a capable partner. I claw my way across the sparse forest, grateful to have avoided the worst of the obstacles, and when I'm finally close enough to properly discern Warner's face, I pull back my invisibility. I'm shaking with exhaustion. I'd only barely recovered from being drugged nearly to death, and yet here I am, already about to die again. But when I look up, half-bent, hands on my knees, and trying to breathe, I realize I have no right to complain. Warner looks even worse than I expected. Raw, clenched, a vein straining at his temple. He's on his knees holding on to Jay like he's trying to hold back a riot, and I didn't realize until just this second that he might be here for more than just emotional support. The whole thing is surreal. They're both practically naked, in the dirt, on their knees. Jay with her hands pressed flat against her ears, and I can't help but wonder what kind of hell brought them to this moment. I thought I was the one having a weird night. Something slams suddenly into my gut, and I double over hitting the ground hard. Arms shaking, I push up onto all fours and scan the immediate area for the culprit. When I spot it, I gag. A dead bird, a couple feet away. Jesus. Jay is still screaming. I shove my way through a sudden, violent gust of wind, and just when I've regained my balance, ready to clear the last 50 feet toward my friends, the world goes mute. Sound off. No howling winds, no tortured screams, no coughs, no sneezes. This is not ordinary quiet. It's not stillness, not silence. It's more than that. It's nothing at all. I blink, blink, my head turning in slow, excruciating motion as I scan the distance for answers, willing the explanations to appear hoping the sheer force of my mind is enough to sprout reason from the ground. It isn't. I've gone deaf. Nazira is no longer here. Jay and Warner are still fifty feet away, and I've gone deaf. Deaf to the sound of the wind, to the shuddering trees. Deaf to my own labored breathing, to the cries of citizens in the compounds beyond. I try to clench my fists, and it takes forever, like the air has grown dense, thick. Something is wrong with me. I'm slow. Slower than I've ever been. Like I'm running underwater. Something is purposely keeping me back. Physically pushing me away from Juliet. And suddenly, it all makes sense. My earlier confusion dissolves. Of course no one else is here. Of course no one else has come to help. Emmeline would never allow it. Maybe I got this far only because she was too busy to notice me right away, to sense me here, in my invisible state. It makes me wonder what else she's done to keep this area clear of trespassers. It makes me wonder if I'll survive. It's growing harder to think. It takes forever to fuse thoughts. It takes forever to move my arms, to lift my head, to look around. By the time I manage to pry open my mouth, I've forgotten that my voice makes no sound. A flash of gold in the distance. I spot Warner, shifting so slowly I wonder whether we're both suffering from the same affliction. He's fighting desperately to sit up next to Jay. Jay, who's still on her knees, bent forward, mouth open. Her eyes are squeezed shut in concentration, but if she's screaming, I can't hear it. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't terrified. I'm close enough to Warner and Jay to be able to make out their expressions, but it's no good. I have no idea whether they're injured, so I don't know the extent of what we're dealing with. I have to get closer, somehow. But when I take a single, painful step forward, a sharp keening explodes in my ears. I cry out soundlessly, clapping my hands to my head as the silence is suddenly, viciously, compounded by pressure. The knife-like pain needles into me, pressure building in my ears with an intensity that threatens to crush me from the inside. 
It's like someone has overfilled my head with helium. Like any minute now, the balloon that is my brain will explode. And just when I think the pressure might kill me, just when I think I can't bear the pain any longer, the ground begins to rumble. Tremble. There's a seismic crack. And sound comes back online. Sound so violent, it rips open something inside of me. And when I finally tear my hands away from my ears, they're red, dripping. I stagger as my head pounds. Rings. Rings. I wipe my bloody hands on my bare torso, and my vision swims. I lunge forward in a stupor and land badly, my still damp palms hitting the earth so hard the force of it shudders up my bones. The dirt beneath my feet has gone slick, wet. I look up, squinting at the sky and the sudden torrential rain. My head continues to swing on a well-oiled hinge. A single drop of blood drips down my ear, lands on my shoulder. A second drop of blood drips down my ear, lands on my shoulder. A third drop of blood drips down my... Name. Someone calls my name. The sound is large, aggressive. The word careens dizzily in my head, expanding and contracting. I can't pin it down. Kenji. I turn around, and my head rings. Rings. Kenji. I blink, and it takes days. Revolutions around the sun. Trust it. Friend. Something is touching me. Under me, hauling me up. But it's no good. I don't move. Too heavy. I try to speak, but can't. I say nothing. Do nothing as my mind is broken open as cold fingers reach inside my skull and disconnect the circuitry within. I stand still, stiffen. The voice echoes to life in the blackness behind my eyes, speaking words that feel more like memory than conversation, words I don't know, don't understand. The pain I carry, the fears I should have left behind. I sag under the weight of loneliness, the chains of disappointment. My heart alone weighs a thousand pounds. I'm so heavy I can no longer be lifted away from the earth. I'm so heavy I have no choice now but to be buried beneath it. I'm so heavy. Too heavy. I exhale as I go down. My knees crack as they hit the ground. My body slumps forward. Dirt kisses my face, welcomes me home. The world goes suddenly dark. Brave. My eyes flicker. Sound hums in my ears, something like dull, steady electricity. Everything is plunged into darkness. A blackout. A blackout in the natural world. Fear clings to my skin. Covers me. But. Weak. Knives bore holes into my bones that fill quickly with sorrow. Sorrow so acute it takes my breath away. I've never been so hopeful to cease existing. I am floating. Weightless and yet weighted down. Destined to sink forever. Dim light fractures the blackness behind my eyes and in the light I see water. My sun and moon are the sea, my mountains, the ocean. I live in liquid I never drink, drowning steadily in marbled, milky waters. My breathing is heavy, automatic, mechanic. I am forced to inhale, forced to exhale. The harsh, shuddering rasp of my own breath is my constant reminder of the grave that is my home. I hear something. It reverberates through the tank, dull metal against dull metal, arriving at my ears as if from outer space. I squint at the fresh set of shapes and colors, blurred forms. I clench my fists, but my flesh is soft, my bones like fresh dough, my skin peeling in moist flakes. 
I am surrounded by water, but my thirst is insatiable. And my anger. My anger! Something snaps. My head. My mind. My neck. My eyes are wide. My breathing panicked. I'm on my knees. My forehead pressed into the dirt. My hands buried in wet earth. I sit straight up and back. My head spinning. What the fuck? I'm still trying to breathe. I look around. My heart is racing. What? What? I was digging my own grave. Slithering, terrifying horror moves through my body as I understand. Emmeline was in my head. She wanted to see if she could get me to kill myself. And even as I think it, even as I look down at the miserable attempt I made to bury myself alive, I feel a dull, stabbing sympathy for Emmeline. Because I felt her pain. And it wasn't cruel. It was desperate. Like she was hoping that if I killed myself while she was in my head, somehow I'd be able to kill her too. Jay is screaming again. I stagger to my feet, heart in my throat, as the skies wrench open, releasing their wrath upon me. I'm not sure why Emmeline gave the inside of my head a shot. Brave, but weak. But I know enough to understand that whatever the hell is happening here is more than I can handle on my own. Right now, I can only hope that everyone in the sanctuary is okay, and that Nazira gets back here soon. Until then, my broken body will have to do its best. I push forward. Even as old, cold blood dries in my ears, across my chest, I push forward, steeling myself against the increasingly volatile weather conditions. The steady succession of earthquakes. The lightning strikes. The raging thunderstorm growing quickly into a hurricane. Once I'm finally close enough, Warner looks up. He seems stunned. It occurs to me then that he's only just seeing me. After all this, he's only just realizing I'm here. A flicker of relief flashes through his eyes, too quickly replaced by pain. And then he calls out two words. Two words I never thought I'd inspire him to say. Help me! The sentence is carried off in the wind, but the agony in his eyes remains. And from this vantage point, I finally understand the depth of what he's endured. At first, I'd thought Warner was only holding her steady, trying to be supportive. I was wrong. Jay is vibrating with power, and Warner is only barely hanging on to her, holding her still. Something, someone, is physically animating Juliet's body, articulating her limbs, trying to force her upright and possibly away from here, and it's only because of Warner that Emmeline hasn't succeeded. I have no idea how he's doing it. Jay's skin has gone translucent, veins bright and freakish in her pale face. She's nearly blue, ready to crack. A low-level hum emanates from her body, the crackle of energy, the buzz of power. I grab onto her arm, and in the half-second Warner shifts to distribute her weight between us, the three of us are flung forward. We hit the ground so hard I can hardly breathe, and when I'm finally able to lift my head, I look at Warner, my own eyes wide with unmasked terror. Emmeline is doing this, I say, shouting the words at him. He nods, his face grim. What can we do? I cry. How can she just keep screaming like this? Warner only looks at me. He just looks at me. And the tortured expression in his eyes tell me everything I need to know. Jay can't keep screaming like this. She can't just be here on her knees screaming for a century. This shit is going to kill her. Jesus Christ. I knew it was bad, but for some reason I didn't think it was this bad. Jay looks like she's going to die. Should we try to pick her up? I don't even know why I ask. I doubt I could lift her arm above my head, much less her whole body. 
My own body is still shaking, so much so that I can barely do my part to keep this girl from lifting directly off the ground. I have no idea what kind of crazy shit is pumping through her veins right now, but Jay is on another planet. She looks half alive, mostly alien. Her eyes are squeezed shut, her jaw unhinged. She's radiating energy. It's fucking terrifying. And I can barely keep up. The ache in my arms has begun to creep up my shoulders and down my back, and I shiver, violently, when a sharp wind strikes my bare, overheated skin. Let's try, Warner says. I nod, take a deep breath, beg myself to be stronger than I am. I don't know how I do it, but through nothing short of a miracle, I make it to my feet. Warner and I manage to bind Juliet between us, and when I look over at him... I'm at least relieved to discover that he looks like he's struggling, too. I've never seen Warner struggle, not really, and I'm pretty sure I've never seen him sweat. But as much as I'd love to laugh a little right now, the sight of him straining so hard just to hold on to her only sends a fresh wave of fear through me. I have no idea how long he's been trying to restrain her all by himself. I have no idea what would have happened to her if he hadn't been there to hold on. And I have no idea what would happen to her right now if we were to let go. Something about that realization gives me renewed strength. It takes choice out of the situation. Jay needs us right now, period. Which means I have to be stronger. Standing upright like this has made us an easy target in all this madness, and I call out a warning as a piece of debris flies toward us. I pivot sharply to protect Jay, but take a hit to my spine, the pain so breathtaking I'm seeing stars. My back was already injured earlier tonight, and the bruises are bound to be worse now. But when Warner locks eyes with me in a sudden terrified panic, I nod, letting him know I'm okay. I've got her. Inch by agonizing inch, we move back toward the sanctuary. We're dragging Jay like she's Jesus between us, her head flung backward, feet dragging across the ground. She's finally stopped screaming, but now she's convulsing, her body seizing uncontrollably, and Warner looks like he's hanging on to his sanity by a single fraying thread. It feels like centuries pass before we see Nazira again, but the rational part of my brain suspects it must have been only 20, 30 minutes. Who knows? I'm sure she was trying her best to get back here with people who could help, but it feels like we're too late. Everything feels too late. I have no idea what the hell is happening anymore. Yesterday, this morning, an hour ago, I was worried about James and Adam. I thought our problems were simple and straightforward. Get the kids back, kill the Supreme Commanders, have a nice lunch. But now... Nazira and Castle and Brendan and Nuria rush to a sudden stop before us. They look between us. They look beyond us. Their eyes go round, their lips parting as they gasp. I crane my neck to see what they're seeing and realize that there's a tidal wave of fire headed straight toward us. I think I'm going to collapse. My body is worse than unsteady. By this point, my legs are made of rubber. I can barely support my own weight, and it's a miracle I'm holding on to Jay at all. In fact, a quick glance at Warner's clenched, insanely tense body is all it takes to realize that he's probably doing most of the work right now. I don't know how any of us are going to survive this. I can't move. I sure as hell can't outrun a wave of fire. And I don't really understand everything that happens next. I hear an inhuman cry and Stefan is suddenly rushing toward us. Stefan. He's suddenly in front of us, suddenly between us. He picks Jay up and into his arms like she might be a rag doll and starts shouting at all of us to run. Castle hangs back to redirect water from a nearby well, and though his efforts at dousing the flames aren't entirely successful, it's enough to give us the edge we need to escape. Warner and I drag ourselves back to camp with the others, and the minute we cross the threshold into the sanctuary, we're met with a frantic sea of faces. Countless figures surge forward, their shouts and cries and hysterical commotion fusing into a single unbroken soundstorm. 
Logically, I understand why people are out here, worried, crying, shouting unanswered questions at each other. But right now, I just want them all to get the hell out of my way. Nuria and Sam seem to read my mind. They bark orders into the crowd, and the nameless bodies begin to clear out. Stefan is no longer running, but walking briskly, elbowing people out of his way as necessary, and I'm grateful. But when Sonia and Sarah come sprinting toward us, shouting for us to follow them to the medical tent, I nearly launch myself forward and kiss them both. I don't. Instead, I take a moment to search for Castle, wondering if he made it out okay. But when I look back, scanning our stretch of protected land, I experience a sudden sobering moment of realization. The disparity between in here and out there is unreal. In here, the sky is clear. The weather settled. The ground seems to have sutured itself back together. The wall of fire that tried to chase us all the way back to the sanctuary is now nothing but fading smoke. The trees are in their upright positions. The hurricane is little more than a fine mist. The morning looks almost pretty. For a second, I could have sworn I heard a bird chirping. I'm probably out of my mind. I collapse in the middle of a well-worn path leading back to our tents, my face thudding against wet grass. The smell of fresh, damp earth fills my head, and I breathe it in. All of it. It's a bomb. A miracle. Maybe, I think. Maybe we're going to be okay. Maybe I can close my eyes. Take a moment. Warner stalks past my prone body, his motions so intense I'm startled upright into a sitting position. I have no idea how he's still moving. He's not even wearing shoes. No shirt, no socks, no shoes. Just a pair of sweatpants. I notice for the first time that he's got a huge gash across his chest. Several cuts on his arms. A nasty scratch on his neck. Blood is dripping slowly down his torso, and Warner doesn't even seem to notice. Scars all over his back. Blood smeared across his front. He looks insane. But he's still moving, his eyes hot with rage and something else. Something that scares the shit out of me. He catches up to Stefan, who's still holding Jay, who's still having seizures, and I crawl toward a tree, using the trunk to hoist myself off the ground. I drag myself after them, flinching involuntarily at a sudden breeze. I turn too fast scanning the open woods for debris or a flying boulder, and find only Nazira, who rests a hand on my arm. Don't worry, she says. We're safe within the borders of the sanctuary. I blink at her, and then around, at the familiar white tents that cloak every solid, freestanding structure on the glorified campsite that is this place of refuge. Nazira nods. Yeah. That's what the tents are for. Nuria enhanced all of her light protections with some kind of antidote that makes us immune to the illusions Emmeline creates. Both acres of land are protected, and the reflective material covering the tents provides more assured protection indoors. How do you know all of that? I asked. I blink at her again. I feel dumb. Numb like I broke something deep inside my brain, deep inside my body. Juliet, I say. It's the only word I've got right now, and Nazira doesn't even bother to correct me, to tell me her real name is Ella. She just takes my hand and squeezes. Ella. <laughs> Juliet. When I dream, I dream of sound. Rain, taking its time, softly popping against concrete. Rain, gathering, drumming, until sound turns into static. Rain, so sudden, so strong, it startles itself. I dream of water dripping down lips and tips of noses. Rain falling off branches into shallow, murky pools. 
I hear death when puddles shatter, assaulted by heavy feet. I hear leaves, leaves shuddering under the weight of resignation, yoked to branches too easily bent, broken. I dream of wind, lengths of it, yards of wind, acres of wind, infinite whispers fusing to create a single breeze. I hear wind comb the wild grass of distant mountains. I hear wind howling confessions in empty, lonely plains. I hear the shh-shh-shh of desperate rivers trying to hush the world in a fruitless effort to hush itself. But buried in the din is a single scream so steady it goes every day unheard. We see but do not understand the way it stutters hearts, clenches jaws, curls fingers into fists. It's a surprise, always a surprise, when it finally stops screaming long enough to speak. Fingers tremble. Flowers die. The sun flinches. The stars expire. You are in a room, a closet, a vault, no key. Just a single voice that says, Kill me. <laughs>